revelation. But before we go there, um, in John 14, verse 6, uh, Jesus Christ said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Heaven is also very real. And all of us will go there who have put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know that. And, and there are over 162 references in the New Testament alone which warns people of hell and over 70 of those mentioned or verses or references in the Bible were uttered or were proclaimed by Jesus himself. So, can you imagine Jesus mentioning hell more than mentioning heaven in the Bible? So, if hell is a myth, then, then you will not even read it in the, in the pages of the scriptures. Now, let's follow along as I read Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. This is, this is you know, picture yourself there. Uh, in, the, in the final judgment of God. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Listen to this very carefully, verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, there are people who would tell you today that, you know, I don't, I don't believe God would send people to hell. Did you know that I agree with that 100%? Hmm. Surprise? Well, God did not is not sending people there. People chooses to go there. You understand? You see, in this verse, in this passage, you know, everyone stands before God. And you will be pronounced, I mean, you will be sentenced according to what you have done in life. If you have put your faith in Jesus, God would say, Enter into my kingdom and my rest. If you did not accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're standing there. Now, it will happen. I'm telling you. It's not that, oh, it's not going to be until how many years. But it will happen. So, you stand there and... You're hearing the names. And you're waiting and waiting and waiting for your name to be called. and Never. Can you imagine how dreadful? Can you imagine how scary that will be? And you know, the scariest part there is that there's no, there's no way for you to go back. Because when you stand there, you, already, you, you have died already, physically. And, and that final judgment is just a formality for God to say, okay, you're in heaven and you're in hell. You chose to be in hell. So let me tell you, if you're here this morning and, and you're still trying to think, oh, I'm not really sure yet. Well, I want you to be sure right now because this will happen. This is what the Bible says. Again, let me read verse 15. And the sea gave up the dead and were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And verse 15 says, And anyone not found written in the book of life. You, you, I, you cannot say, Oh, um, my, my husband didn't tell me. My mom didn't tell me. My kids didn't tell me they're Christians. But you see, you have heard. And, and, and the most Painful thing here, when this happened, is, is you know, when you're there, 
you know that you've heard the gospel. And yet you choose to harden your heart. And that is the most unbearable regret that you will have for the rest of eternity. It's not only for one year or for two years, but it's for eternity. Now, beloved, we're serious here. Hell is real. People go there when they die without the Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts. There's no amount of good work. There's no amount of being a good person. It's not automatic. You have to repent of your sins. You have to ask Jesus to come into your heart so that you will make sure your name is written in the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? Now, you cannot bring someone to heaven if you yourself is not saved. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ warned these people who were trying to drive out demons in the name of Jesus, they themselves don't know Jesus. And the evil spirit said, Jesus, I know, but who are you? So beloved, again, God is not sending people to hell. People chose or choose to be there. Hell is prepared to Satan and the Antichrist and all the angels that followed him. It was made for them, not for us. That's why as we go along in our next point, we'll see that the reason why we need to share the gospel and save and, and, and ask the Lord to save the lost is because our love and the love of Christ demands it. We are commanded to win souls for Jesus because Jesus created them. He loves them. He died for them. And he said, I don't want any to perish. Because the heartbeat of God and his desire is that none should be lost. Let's read 2 Peter 3, 9. Okay, can you join me please? 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's read this together. Ready? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is what is in the heart of Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-4 to says, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. And then verse 4 says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why we are encouraged to pray for our government, for the president, the past president, the present president, and those who will become president. And all in the authorities because God's desire is for all men to be saved. John 3.16, let's all recite it by memory. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Now, someone has said concerning the church today, and I'm going to mention this not to feel us, or make us feel sad or depressed or guilty, but this is happening all over the place. Someone has said concerning the church today, we have stopped caring about the lost and being a witness for Jesus. And we only care about ourselves. We have brought self to the church and glorified and exalted self. We have brought covetousness into the church and sanctified it. And it is causing the unsaved to mock and ridicule the church. God has called us to lay down our lives, not to take it up. He has called us to serve and not demand to be served. And Jesus said, He who is 
first will be last, and he who is last will be first. So the question for us again is, do we love him? Do we love the Lord Jesus Christ enough that we love those he loves? That we're willing to sacrifice just for us to win at least one soul for him. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 15 says, For the love of Christ compels us. It is the love of Christ that drives them and, and makes them attack the enemy's territory for them to grab even one soul to bring at the feet of Jesus. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should, not, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, in the life and in the heart of the late uh, Charles Hudden Spurgeon, this is what he said. And, and this is so powerful. Let me just quote what he said. If sinners be damned, at least, let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they perish, or if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. And at the end he said, let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Isn't that a powerful statement? If that's my heart, if that's your heart, <laughs> then, then we're not going to let go of one soul. Now, let me remind all of us here that if you're wondering, if you're trying to ask, so who will be the person that I will bring to Christ? Well, just look, just look in the room. Look, look to your right, look to your left. Look at your son, look at your daughter. Maybe they have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, parents, parents with young kids, parents with teenagers, parents with adult children, if you're wondering who to share the gospel with, maybe you should thank them first. Your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister. And most of the time, we're afraid to share the gospel with our family members because they're the bravest ones to ridicule us, right? Oh, you're preaching to me again. Stop that nonsense. No, don't, don't tell me about that word. But if you love your brother, if you love your wife who is not saved, if you love your parents who are not saved, if you truly love them, then you will love them enough and that you will gather enough courage to love them and share the gospel with them. Right? So you don't need to look really outside. If you have an unsaved loved one, bring that loved one to Jesus. Share the gospel to that person, to your brother or your sister. And if you don't have any, then look for your friend. Okay? So what are we going to do about this challenge? The challenges that I have given to you today. Now, there are contributing factors for not sharing the gospel. I've been mentioning some of those already. But... The first thing that comes to mind is that you don't know what to say. Now, we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> but this is an excuse that I hear all the time. I don't know what to say. Well, <laughs> if, you have, if you have a testimony, if you have been saved, then you have something to say, right? Because you have your testimony. You have your salvation experience. That's what you say to the, uh, to the unsaved. The most powerful tool to witness is not about the spiritual laws. They're good. I, I, I'm not saying that they're not good. It's not about how to share your faith. It's not about uh, the Roman road or anything. It's your testimony that you share to a person. And all you have to do is, did you know that I was once like this? But when I came to know Jesus, I was changed. And that would, that would prompt them to pay attention. 
You don't need to, to quote scriptures and tell other stories about how religious you are. Because if you do that, they will argue with you and say, oh yeah, I'll go to church too. But when you say to them, you know, this is my life before. And I found Jesus. And, and, and since then, my life has changed. And, and now I'm, I'm bound to heaven. Okay? So you don't know what to say, but you have, you have something to say actually. Uh, second is fear of being rejected and insulted. It's a very familiar excuse not to share the gospel. Number three, apathy. You just don't care if people go to hell because you have so much in your schedule, in your plate. And it, it's there. If you're trying to reason out you're busy, everyone is busy. You don't have time. Everyone says they don't have time. But beloved, there are